hello there, and welcome to Roundtable here on Telil Community Television. I'm your host, Adam Cook. On this week's show, the former Innovations and Economic Development Officer for Richmond County and the town of Port Hawkesbury has a new job developing the energy sector for these two municipal units. I'll get reaction from Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett to this move involving Martin Thompson. You're also going to hear from the head of an organization that is designed to preserve and protect the Bredor Lake watershed. It's made up of Cape Breton's five Mi'kmaq communities and its five municipal units. You'll hear from Bidabaz Stan Johnson later on in the show. But right now, we're going to begin with another look at housing in Richmond County. On our sister program, Talil 24-7, and on Talil's Municipal Council broadcasts, you may have noticed that Richmond Warden Amanda Mubriket provided a housing needs assessment update to the March 25th regular meeting of Municipal Council. Well, the council meeting of that night was also busy with housing matters of a different sort. In just a couple of minutes, you're going to hear Warden Mubriket giving an update from the Straight Richmond Housing Matters Coalition. But first of all, we have an update for you on the drive to turn a former school building in Evanston, not far from the Straight Richmond Hospital, into affordable housing units. In 2014, the Straight Regional School Board, the forerunner to the Straight Regional Center for Education, voted to shut down the West Richmond Education Center in Evanston. The building has also been known for many years as Walter Fougier School. It has sat idle since that time, but Richmond Municipal Councillors have attempted to see if the building could be used to house medical professionals, including doctors, nurses, and others, that might be brought to serve at the nearby Strait Richmond Hospital or at other medical facilities around the Strait area. An independent audit of the building was carried out, and at the time it was determined that the price tag for refurbishing this type of building for a housing purpose would come in at nearly $6 million. In February, Council decided to put out a request for purchase to see if any interested buyers were out there and to see if the building could be used for housing purposes, even if the municipality was selling it off. At the same time, Council introduced amendments to the Central Richmond Secondary Plan and Land Use Bylaw that would permit former institutional buildings to be converted into housing. Institutional buildings, according to Warden Amanda Mumberkett, included school buildings, but could also include former medical facilities or anywhere else that might have been considered a formal institution at the time. Shortly before the March 25th regular council meeting at the Richmond Municipal Building in Arishat, councillors held a formal public hearing on the amendments to the Central Richmond Secondary Plan and Land Use Bylaw. Having heard no complaints at this public hearing, council voted to move ahead with second and final reading of the amendments at the regular council meeting of March 25th. So we are looking for a motion to give second reading approval to the Central Richmond Secondary Plan and Land Use Bylaw to allow former institutional buildings to be converted into dwelling units. So if I could have a motion for uh, second reading approval. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Could I have a seconder on that, please? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Councillor Brent Sampson. Is there any further discussion on the second reading approval? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion is carried. Housing turned out to be a major topic of conversation at the March 25th regular meeting of Richmond Municipal Council. Warden Amanda Mumberkett also gave a wide-ranging update on Richmond County's housing strategies that came out of a meeting held the previous week between Council and members of the Nova Scotia Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You can hear more about Richmond's housing priorities on our sister program, Talil 24-7. But right now, we'd like to present to you an update that Warden Mumberkett gave at the March 25th regular meeting of Council regarding the Straight Richmond Housing Matters Coalition. Number one, our two housing support workers that work in this region uh, between Richmond County and Port Hawkesbury, um, they're, they've been working on a contract with Cape Breton, housing, Cape Breton Community Housing Authority, which is a nonprofit based in, in Sydney area. Um, they, that contract is being transferred to the local YMCA, which works out of Port Hawkesbury. So I think that's really great that there'll be some kind of more local management um, for those, uh, those workers to be able to depend on. 
um, which means they are, um, you know, they'll, they'll be, I think, better able to kind of respond when they need that, that kind of senior guidance. Um, I did want to mention also that they've been doing a really fantastic job. They have signed a lease, I think, as of uh, Wednesday for the 14th family that they've been working with just since January, so just in a couple of months, um, and so it looks really promising. Um, but it is, it does continue to be a, a challenge um, finding, um, you know, finding appropriate housing for folks. Um, the regional, uh, sorry, the Nova Scotia Nonprofit Housing Association, I did also want to mention we had an update from them. So from the coalition, Cheryl McDaniel sits on the, the Provincial Nonprofit Housing Association on our behalf. Um, she does a great job representing us, and they are looking at potentially putting on a community information session. Um, and I've also pitched uh, that, sh you know, if we're able to get a joint meeting scheduled with Port Hawkesbury, I've requested that the town consider having this association come in to do a presentation to both councils as well, because it would really kind of kill two birds with one stone. We could learn more about how they can support us. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, I think another couple of items that I wanted to mention specifically was that um, we are looking at doing another service-based count. I cannot believe, I think it's been something like three years since our last service-based count, and I know that that provides us with some really excellent local data um, in terms of people who are both uh, either homeless or who are precariously housed um, right now. So um, looks like they will be uh, conducting that count during the month of May. Um, and uh, and you know, it'll cover again all of the eastern zones, so we'll hopefully have more and more service providers uh, participate in that, and we'll get some really great data as a result. So I think that was, a, I guess, some of the highlights I wanted to mention, um, but there are other items in the, in the report, uh, in the minutes. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to shoot them my way. Okay, and just uh, maybe for members of the public watching at home, the, the Straight Richmond Housing Matters Coalition is really, it's a really just a network and information sharing and advocacy network. Um, so um, not, ex not, a, not a formalized not-for-profit organization, but certainly a valuable one. Um, and I know we were all during our election campaigns well engaged with them as they made housing a priority during the municipal elections last time. I would anticipate they'll be doing the same this time. You may recall that Richmond County is in the market for developing a new multi-purpose facility to eventually replace the aging Richmond Arena on Whiteside Road in Lewisdale. Well, the Richmond Arena still has its own issues to be dealt with while this new multi-purpose facility is being planned out. For example, at the March 25th regular meeting of Richmond Council at the Municipal Building in Arishat, there was a lengthy discussion about the need to purchase new refrigerant for the Richmond Arena. How did that discussion play out? Let's go to the footage right now. I do recall, of course, that we did have, um, you know, a major leak of the R22 um, refrigerant. Um, and it apparent, I did not realize how difficult it was to get. And it sounds like there is an opportunity uh, for us to obtain some at an advantageous price uh, compared to the market price. So market price would be about $100 per pound. Um, and the price that uh, is available to us right now from another facility is $45 per pound. So it's a pretty significant savings. Okay. That being said, the facility, uh, the opportunity to purchase is a 780 pounds of the R22 refrigerant <coughs> is available to us at $45 a pound would be a cost of 35,100 excluding HST. Um, so I believe the idea is that we've got a you know a recommendation from council at the or from sorry from staff at this stage to approve the purchase uh, now of the refrigerant, uh, but conduct the purchase after April 1st so that it would fall within next year's fiscal year so it could be included in the budget for next year. Um, so it wouldn't be a departure from this year's budget, but because we don't have a budget approved yet for next year. Um, we, do, we would need to make a motion uh, to make that special purchase. Um, yeah, so any comments or questions on that? I'd be willing to make that motion going forward. Okay. Um, so staff has recommended the, that the motion be to purchase the available refrigerant and further move to proceed with the purchase on or after April 1st. I just want to make that, that okay to note in your motion. Okay, in advance of budget approval. Okay, thank you, Councillor Brent Sampson. Could I have a seconder? Yeah, I'll second the motion. 
Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Any further discussion on that item? Yeah. Go. Um, so while I do understand the idea that it wouldn't affect our current year's budget, like in the past, we found ourselves with surpluses in our year. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, and again, I know that we are not really aware where we're sitting with that, but I'm just wondering if maybe the CAO has an idea of where it looked like we were trending in the current fiscal because it actually might be better off for us to make an adjustment to current year budget, therefore leaving next year's budget freer for the pieces that are coming forward. Madam Chair, through you, uh, we were trending in the positive with a surplus and probably could absorb it uh, in the current. If that was council's wish, keeping in mind that we did have overages at that facility already due to the repair, mm -hmm. um, that that was quite costly because uh, it affected both units. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do believe, um, as things were trending at the last look, um, we could absorb that in this year's if if need be. If there are no other comments regarding the motion, I would propose a, an amendment to the motion um, to uh, include it in the 2023-24 budget. And I don't know if um, if Chris may have that available or not. I, I noticed down in his notes that if the R22 did not become available, we may have to look at an R453A refrigerant, which is the newer style, not the newest, but still newer than what we have there. I just wondered if we could get a price on because again if we get a complete fill safe and then we can't get no more the r22 we've spent 30 or forty thousand dollars into the last amount of refrigerant we can get i'm wondering if we get a price on the cost of replacing the i know it's not going to be anywhere close no. <laughs> however um i think we're gonna we have to look at you know if we're going to be replacing the building or if we're going to try and do the upgrades and and repairs to that building we might be further off looking at investing a little more for a re full refrigeration unit that uses the current refrigerant then. Yeah, I can understand where you're coming from. The only thing I would think I would say to that is I'm assuming based on the uh, shortage of this in general, not that I'm any kind of expert on this stuff, um, if we were to have a situation like what you're describing, it would probably be possible for them to sell this back off to another municipality or another arena. You know what I mean? So that way I think uh, you could recover a lot of your costs. Mm -hmm. And as it gets, you know, or maybe all of your costs, depending if it's if it's hard to, to get in that fashion. And, and maybe so. I just, uh, I don't think there's anybody else using the R22. I think we're one of the last kick at the cats. It's the 1969, I believe, was the, um, or 79 build. And pretty much every arena has been refurbished since then, so... Yeah, and it's it's a great point you're making, Councillor Digden. I think the the issue though is that you know even if we decide to kind of move to a newer type of refrigerant, it's going to take time for that equipment to get installed, for that you know all of that to happen. What happens if we have a major leak again between now and then, right? So I think it's a timing thing for us. We we you know we could be potentially without ice for a long period of time, right? Um, well, we, we don't only have a week left, but we're looking at September. Like the, rea the, the idea, is, I guess the reality is, is that even trying to get a contractor in to do a whole replacement of the system, you know, that's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take months and months. And so I think, um, I think that's why the recommendation is coming from staff. Would I be fair to say, yeah. It is. It's the case. favorable market price at yeah. this point uh, for something that is getting harder and harder to come by and trying to limp along the building as best we can. Good points, though, uh, certainly, okay. Councillor Digden. And um, so I think um, Councillor Melanie Sampson has made a friendly amendment, uh, proposed a friendly amendment to the motion um, that uh, we proceed with the purchase of the available refrigerate, refrigerant, but further move to proceed with the purchase during this fiscal year. Councillor Brent Sampson, you had made the original motion. Are you okay with that amendment? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I'd rather stick with staff's recommendation. Okay. So, yeah. Um, all right, so 
then I think what we'll have to do process-wise is we'll have to go through and vote on that motion. Um, and if it, uh, if it passes, that, that'll be the, the plan forward. If not, then we can open for a, a different type of motion if, if council chooses. Um, is, is there any further discussion before I take the vote on this? So just to be clear, it's to support the purchase of the refrigerant and to proceed with the purchase on or after April 1st in advance of budget approval. When the final vote took place on the motion regarding the purchase of refrigerant for the Richmond Arena, the only nay vote cast was that of District 3 Councillor Melanie Sampson, who had introduced the amendment to try to get the spending done before the end of the current fiscal year. You may know that for the past year, Richmond County and the Town of Port Hawkesbury have been sharing an Innovations and Economic Development Officer. He's Martin Thompson and his post has been created for the two units by the Cape Breton Partnership. Well, the partnership has seconded Thompson so he can take on a new role shared between the town and the county, specifically the new Manager of Energy Sector Development for Richmond and Port Hawkesbury. Among Thompson's new duties, creating a local port and infrastructure strategy and an offshore wind center of excellence. So here's Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett talking about what Thompson has brought to the straight area over the past year, the potential for him in his new role as Manager of Energy Sector Development, and the possibilities for the person who will fill Thompson's previous post of Innovations and Economic Development Officer for the county and the town. We've been working on this for quite some time, uh, and I will tell you Martin has been working on this for quite some time, so he's been a great asset to the economic development landscape here in Richmond and the town of Port Hawkesbury. Um, you know, he was hired with a skill set that was, you know, very specific uh, to the energy transition that we're going to be facing going forward. We know that, uh, you know, coal-fired plants are going to be phased out, um, and we have a great big coal-fired facility here, and so, um, you know, what are the other energy options that we can be looking at of course wind solar etc etc so being able to have a person in place uh, like Martin to become our new energy transition manager I think is fantastic he understands the value of engaging with community which is a, is a critically important piece of this piece of work going forward. He understands uh, the value of you know learning from best practices in other regions. He's seen it in action, certainly from his time in Scotland. Um, so we're really fortunate to have him taking on this new role for us, and excited to see who you know who may uh, you know take up his uh, former role as a general economic development officer for for the region. So we are it's kind of a win-win for us right now. Even as Martin Thompson prepares to fill his new role as Manager of Energy Sector Development for Port Hawkesbury and Richmond County, Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett is optimistic about the person who will wind up filling Thompson's previous role as the two units Innovations and Economic Development Officer, as overseen by the Cape Breton Partnership. For example, Warden Mumberkett feels there are many economic opportunities to be developed within Richmond County, including several that have been laid out in Richmond County's most recent strategic plan. We've got some priorities outlined in there, certainly tourism, 12 month of the year tourism was among them. But of course, there are things like we just talked about, you know, housing, um, there may be other small business supports, um, but certainly we look at the, you know, the work of the Cape Breton Partnership and, and how a person can, you know, make sure that the di different programs and services that they have can be deployed effectively here in Richmond County, everything from the connector program to, you know, um, you know, to the, to the various immigration related uh, services that they provide as well. So. I'm, um, you know, I think there's a whole pile of additional points that we could be hitting, um, and I, I, I get questions all the time from the business community, uh, new businesses looking to start up. How, you know, how do I get started? How do I, you know, get a business plan together? And so that's, you know, that's all some the work of, of a traditional economic development officer, either doing that work with the person or um, having, you know, referring them through to other or resources in the organization. So lots, lots of ways that we can be putting, uh, you know, a new, a new person to, to work and um, Martin's done a great job for us uh, but we're also thinking that this is going to be a great fit for him and a great opportunity for somebody new. And now we're going to hear from a man who's had many years of experience in a variety of groups that have been set up to protect and preserve the Verdor Lake watershed. His name is Stan Johnson. He's been involved for years in the Verdor Lake CEPI or Collaborative Environmental Protection Initiative but he is also the interim coordinator for Bidaba. That's a Mi'kmaq word, and it's an organization that actually contains all five of Cape Breton's Mi'kmaq communities and the five municipal units around the island. 
Here is Stan Johnson's presentation about Bidava and its past, present, and future to the Committee of the Whole meeting of Richmond Municipal Council. As you guys know, Bidava, um, it's a Mi'kmaq word. It basically means um, what, what we call the lake uh, thousands of years ago. Basically, when the Bidava Lake filled in about 6,500 years ago, it's, as you would imagine, like a blanket on the ground with a hole in the middle. If you pour water, it would all flow into one area. So that's what basically Bidubah means when the lakes rose, they filled in. It used to be a bunch of lakes, now it's just one big one. Um, it's the world's largest inland saltwater lake, so it's pretty interesting. In 2000, the elders came up with the name Bidubah. I was telling you about, um, it's basically where it, um, the leaders of Cape Breton um, counties, um, the chiefs, and we meet on a monthly basis. Like Bidubah, we usually meet monthly, but now we've um, so that down, we want to get the members of Vidubal back on the table. Um, we've, it's been slacking for a bit. Um, we've right now I'm running as coordinator for a bit till we get it back online. We're hoping to get um, a former counselor in as a uh, the coordinator. Um, we've worked on some initiatives over the years. Um, some have been pretty big. Some are small. Um, like we we study impacts like sewage that will overflow from businesses, treatment plants, anything that goes into the Bridal Lake. We're always, always cognizant of the fact of um, trying to keep the lake healthy, discharge from recreational boulders as well, um, inadequate sewage from, like one of the things we're worried about is, um, I talked to um, Anna Curtis Steele, he used to work with Nova, Nova Scotia Environment, and there's a, uh, she was telling me that there was a clause in one of the, um, a grandfather clause, something back in 72 where it allows cottage owners to basically um, leave a wall up or a porch up and then build a new house around it and keep the old sewage system with the straight pipes going into the lake. Um, that's something that we'd like to get a look at, maybe get a project together to see what type of uh, sewage systems are discharging into the lake right now, like whether it be um, not just the municipalities or the First Nations, but the cottages as well. Um, that would be great to have um, that looked at. Um, a lot of other stuff we've done, the impacts of sewage include like oysters, um, other fishery operations, like uh, one of the things that we're sort of um, Miffed about it because over the years, when MS, we used to have a bustling oyster industry in the Bredore Lake years ago. And um, MSX disease, which came in from, we believe, um, the ships that came into the Lenaris gypsum plant coming from a Virginia area that had the MSX disease probably discharged their ballast into the lake. So um, they're looking at getting the um, little gypsum plant back online again. And uh, we've actually made. Um, um, We've asked the um, people running the um, the operation to actually make presentations to SEPI and to be the boss as well to see, make sure that that doesn't happen again. What can, what can we do to maybe mitigate that from happening again? Um, just like risk to act, recreational activities, laws of ecosystem, traditional big ma medicines, like well, a lot of stuff that's going on around the lake that we're really worried about. Um, and it's um, like one of the things we did was uh, we put up pump out stations around the lake. There's six of them around the lake. So if there's boats coming into the lake, they could actually um, discharge their sewage into the lake in one of these six areas. Um, a few years ago, we had um, a neighbor of mine who lives on the lake. He's, the kids were telling me there was an oil slick coming to the community. And he was oil slick. It was on a Sunday. So he went down by the shore, checked it out. Sure enough, there was a slick on the water. It came in with the tide and came back out. Um, I worked with the band office at the time. I asked our manager who he's, I, I told him what my cousin uh, noticed. He was telling me that he was um, metal detecting that big pond that Sunday, and he saw an American yacht moving into the islands down by a Gold Island area there, and they must have discharged their sewage and then left back out and just left the mess right. So that's the kind of stuff that we were trying to get away from. And we're trying to look at updating outdated sewage treatment plants. Like we've done um, a project with Wego Ama and White Kagama, the, those two communities there. Actually, we did a project together with them where they put in a new sewage treatment plant to help them get funding to organize that. Um, we're doing other projects as well. Um, there's other initiatives that we got coming on down the line. Uh, like we did some climate change models around the lake, the impacts of um, public infrastructure. And we looked at, um, say, the 50 to 100 year line of where the climate change and where the water's going to be at the lake at that time. Okay, we did a climate change conference in 2013 in Guga. Um, we did a bunch of workshops to get traditional knowledge of standing, um, understanding to collaborate on action plans around the lake. And then some of these pallets are, are working in drafting climate change action plans, as you all are, same with the First Nations. So we're helping them to work with your groups as well on those. On uh, the potable water and water conservation projects we're working on, uh, we're working at um, 
Bottle of the, bottle of the water ranges we set up there. They're actually working at working with the um, water supply there. As you know, what bottle they had problem with water over the years. Um, it's it's they got a good system now, and hopefully she stays. I guess the water in the area or the ground is that great for water, so it's that's the problem there. Uh, water water balance project memory two CBRM memory two a runoff um, diversion project we worked on as well. And then dredging silk that was done, uh, we partnership with Environment Canada for the inland waters. Um, and we're doing, doing facilitating dialogue in Inverness County in Wamaku leading to memorandum of understanding for just a, um, a sewage treatment in their area as well. Uh, Bidubah 2024 and beyond, UINR is working on a, um, our partners, CEPI's partner as well with us, and always the biosphere. And we've um, acquired some resources to expand and engage with partners on some of the projects. Uh, we're currently drafting a uh, five-year action plan. Uh, one of the big projects we're working on is called the Maliamugim, which is one of our projects. It's a species at risk initiative that's working at, looking at uh, all the species at risk around the Bordeaux Lakes and the Unamagi and seeing uh, what could be done to maybe um, see what's causing, um, like, the species at risk, like some of the uh, species that we're working at. One of the, most of the... Um, one of the big problems we're looking at is the bumblebees. Basically, um, as we all know, without bumblebees, none of us would exist as well. So we have a big project in looking at those and why there's some that are on a decline and some are coming up. Um, another big project we'll be working on, um, which is we're trying to get, like, the municipalities back online again with the First Nations. It's actually a Numagi uh, Watershed Data Collection Project, which is um, starting up this year. It'll be put on by uh, UINR. And we'll be working with the municipalities on stakeholder, stakeholder engagement and data collection of all the areas. It's a uh, flood mapping, so we we're looking at climate change initiatives there. And it's a um, project put on by the uh, Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And they're working with us, uh, Daniel Bryce, who's the senior planner. The project will start uh, at the end of this month and should um, finish up by September 30, 2025. So we'll be doing engagements in uh, your communities as well as our communities and looking at... Um, Flood mapping. Now uh, we're looking at plant erosion control. One of the big initiatives we looked at was um, Mali Gawaj and Bodolodic. As you guys heard, uh, Bodolodic a couple of years ago was on the news where the graves were coming out of the uh, shoreline there. Uh, when they did some um, research there, they, we did, um, they found a bunch of cadavers basically all around. See, a whole island is actually a burial mound. Mm -hmm. And it was that way before the, even the, uh, the priests came over. So. Um, that's one of the things we're looking at. There's another place in Mali Gawash, actually, that was a burial ground there that was um, uncovered by the Nor'easters we get here. Um, they did a big project there maybe 10, 15 years ago where they just piled a bunch of rocks by the burial ground there to try to keep it from washing into the lake. Um, it worked for a while, but it was emergency control. Now it's actually where it wasn't put in property. It was just an emergency thing. Now that the water is flushing into the rocks, pulling it back out so the silt is coming back out. That's another problem that will have to be looked at again. Um, so in this other area, so we looked at a couple areas in Iona and some other areas around the lake, um, other municipalities were concerned about that. The shorelines are falling into the lake and what can we do? Maybe is there some type of initiatives we can work on to maybe, because Bedore Lake is not the ocean, it's just the lake, but when Northeasters come in, like I've been to Mali Gawaj, when the Northeasters come in and it comes right across the lake, there's nothing stopping it. So when she hits the shore, she hits it hard. <laughs> and mostly Malagawash, those areas are sand, right? So it just pulls it right out and it's gone. Like I had a property there I lost. Just an example, I had a cabin there. Had uh, about 20 feet of grass. There was a couple of trees. There was a road. Another 10 feet of grass and it was the shoreline. It was all about 75 feet in total. Uh, this was in 2003 when I used to go out to the cabin. Uh, now my cabin's gone. I, I gave it away because... The last time I looked, my cabin was two feet over the bank, and it was going to fall into the water. So I gave it to the local guy there. We pulled it in and he used it in another area. But just like 2003 to like last 20 years, lost 75 feet of shoreline. There. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you look at behind, like the problem we're having around the lake is a lot of people are shoring up the shoreline with armor stone. Now these people can afford it and all that, but the adjacent properties too, they're the ones that are getting all the damage, right? So um, that's what we were looking at, maybe um, checking that out and see if there's other initiatives we can do that without using armor and what can we use. So we had a couple of things called uh, reef balls that they used at um, some um, resorts down south where they actually held back the ocean by gaining back 90 feet. Like they, had, they used to have 90 feet of water frontage 
or shoreline before, it came down to right to the wall of the building. Uh, they installed these reef balls in the water. And what a reef ball is, it's like a, you know those hockey balls you used to have with the holes in them? Mm -hmm. There's like half of those. You put them in the water, stack them in, and stack them on each other. And we put an aggregate in there that gets oysters and all this type of um, wildlife to actually stick to it and survive off of it. And it turns into like a little coral reef. But you put them in an area along the shoreline where we get a lot of damage, maybe meet like a foot, 16 inches below the surface, and when the, with big storms coming, they sort of hit those first before they hit the shore, and they peter off behind it. So we're losing a lot of eelgrass and that kind of stuff behind the shorelines everywhere, right? So we're trying to get that going. Um, that's another initiative we're looking on. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but basically this is one of the initiatives we're working on, and we're inviting Beetlebot to come back to the table. Well, you're already at the table, Amanda, but like the other municipalities, we'll be making um, pitches to them as well to work on these initiatives. There's a lot of stuff that we can work together with the First Nations and the um, municipalities. They're all basically bordering on. Well, our borders are there, and we're all touching each other, but when you look at marine spatial planning and the stuff that's coming down the pipe to it, like there's no borders for storms or stuff like that, so we should all work together on these initiatives and uh, make for a more healthier Bredour Lake and for the communities as well. Storms definitely don't pay attention to borders. They don't care about that. So, um, and, and I've certainly heard from lots of landowners about, you know, meters and meters of land that they're losing, um, you know, as, as time passes for sure. Just in our bylaw and policy committee meeting that we had earlier today, we, one of the things we are looking at is committee structure. And we did talk about, you know, Biduba and, and you know, our plans to kind of try to, try to be present there. We kind of talked about it was, you know, it's, Bidaba really is us, right? It is our councils together, all ten, right? So, um, yeah, so I, it's it's really great to have this overview. Um, and I think, too, helpful, because I know from time to time, you know, we, we provide some financial assistance through grants or whatever, so really helpful for us to have this kind of overview. And summary it gives us some context as to what we're investing in, so it's it's great. Thank you. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Roundtable here on Talil Community Television. Thank you for tuning in, and a special thank you to my interview guest this week, Richmond Warden Amanda Mubberkett. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen this week on Roundtable, or you'd just like to make suggestions for a future edition of the show, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly with your ideas and your commentary. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is talil at talil.tv. As always, you can follow Talil on social media. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, as well as Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Our Talil YouTube channel features every single episode of Roundtable, including this one, as well as individual segments and interviews from our shows. We offer the same service for our sister program, Talil 24-7, and you can see the latest French language journalism produced by the newest member of the Talil news team, Jacqueline Gerwar. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this week's edition of Roundtable. I look forward to seeing you soon with a brand new show. Bye for now.